so again, thanks for coming to ECS 173. We have started to talk about the acquisition of 3D surface data from sensors such as radar, LADAR, sonar, and multi-camera systems. So um, <clears throat> today we're going to actually get into the process of how to manipulate that data. And I'm going to start off by telling you some of the things that you might want to do with said 3D surface data. And we're going to talk about smoothing, which <clears throat> if it is basically an analog of the lecture that I gave in the very beginning about how to remove noise from photographic data. So this is going to be the 3D surface analog of that lecture. So um, here's our goal, or here's what we're trying to do. We we collect data with one of these devices that I told you about last time on Wednesday. And um, typically the thing that we get put on disk, or the thing that we receive from these sensors, is a cloud of three-dimensional points that have been connected to each other to form a surface mesh. So in other words, the thing that you'll get, if you have a file that you have read off one of these sensors, the first part of the file will basically give you a set of three-dimensional coordinates, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. And then the second part of the file will tell you, uh, in some sense, how those points are connected to each other to form a closed surface. So it'll basically give you a set of connectivities to say the first, second, and third points connect to each other to form a triangle, the second, fifth, and ninth points connect to each other to form a triangle, and so on. So that if you were to visualize that point set, with those connectivities, you would see a display like I showed you last time, where it's a set of points that have the shape of, for example, my face, if you took a 3D scan of my face. <clears throat> now, given that kind of data, what we want to do with it is uh, to solve a set of pro real world problems that rely basically on really two fundamental core problems which are to extract features from the surfaces and to compute alignments between them. And I'll talk about what both of those mean, but that's basically, um, that's basically what this is. We haven't talked about aligning images together. We will talk about that more in the third part. But we talked about extracting features from photographs in the first segment. And this is really the 3D analog of that, where instead of having a little patch of a photograph that you convert into a vector of numbers that in some way gives you the connotation of what's important and what's relevant inside that image patch, you now have a patch of a 3D surface, or maybe an entire big extended 3D surface as provided by its 3D points and these, these lines that connect them. And you can use those feature vectors for the usual things that we talked about in the first part of the course, for finding correspondences especially. So um, that's kind of our two, that's really going to be the two core problems that really drive all of our applications. <clears throat> now, if you can compute features or, and uh, calculate them in a kind of repeatable and useful way, then you can do a lot of things with these 3D surface meshes. The, um, I don't know if this is going to help if I turn off this light, but those are 3D surfaces where the shading is supposed to give you a connotation of depth. <laughs> so that's an actual 3D scan of a rubber ducky. This is a rubber ducky with Mr. Potato Head and a little car thing in a scene like this. Now, um, if we can compute features, let's say what we can do is for each one of our points on our surface mesh, we calculate some feature. and. Here, I'll describe why this is later, but I'm basically uh, showing each one of my feature vectors as a little plate or a little array, because for this particular feature, it, it gets stored in an array format. So for each one of my points, I can calculate uh, one of these feature vectors or feature arrays. Sometimes these feature vectors are referred to as signatures because they're supposed to be a concise, uh, kind of proprietary description of that part of the world. Now if I do that, what I can do is then use those feature vectors that I got from my 3D model of a rubber ducky to decide what points on this new surface mesh that I have acquired from my 3D sensor seem to look like they correspond to the ducky versus not. So for example, I would take one, of one point like this, calculate its feature vector, and use a classifier to say, well, that probably does look like ducky, or no, that probably does not. 
And you can imagine that if you're good at this classification game, then you can take a large 3D acquisition, a large 3D mesh covering a big part of the world, and reduce it down to just those data items that you are interested in. So I even hate to call this a toy example because they're all toys. But uh, instead of the rubber ducky, imagine that I have a 3D model of something like a tank. And I have an aerial mounted from an airplane mounted radar detector uh, that is taking big scans of a huge swath of battlefield. Or actually, not even battlefield, just terrain where you think there might or might not be tanks. What you can do is use one of these classifiers to reduce your gigantic number of 3D data points that you're acquiring to just those that eh, look like they might correspond to tanks versus not. And I will leave it up to you to figure out why that could be quite useful for somebody in the military. If you can align scans together, then you can do what we talked about a couple of times now, and which you will be learning a lot about in the second homework assignment, which is build 3D models. So here I've got. Uh, an object which is basically an angel-like figurine and I have two points of view from which I've scanned it. <laughs> you can see that they overlap to quite a degree but not 100%. So if I can align these two together, which is to say rotate and translate one so that it lines up well with the other, then I can get a result like this where the red is one of the scans and the white is the other. And if I keep doing that and doing it over and over and over and over and over again from different points of view, you can imagine building up piece by piece by piece a complete description of the entire object from 360 degrees. And again, imagine that instead of a figurine that is uh, some uh, uh, clay model of a figure of a, of a character that you would want to put in a movie and animate, you can imagine how doing this gives you a means to animate that character in a movie or a game. <coughs> Another thing we can do, let's say that I, have, that I am able to align one 3D scan to another, and that I have one 3D scan that corresponds to this object, and another 3D scan that corresponds to a large and extended scene. So again, we can go back to our tank in the battlefield example. And let's say that the first thing that I've done is used that feature vector idea to identify points in the world that look like they might correspond to my object of interest. But as you can see, there's multiple locations in the world that look like they might correspond to my object of interest over here, but also over here, and a little bit over here. So then you might say, well, OK, I have some hypotheses about where this object might be in the world. How can I verify whether one or the other of them is true? And the way you can do that is by aligning this scan to this one using these, or these points or these points or these points as your means of doing the alignment. <coughs> so in other words, what you can do is find a rotation and a translation that aligns this guy up to this part of the world, see how well it fits. Do the same thing over here, align this scan to this part of the world, rotate it, translate it, get it to fit as well as, as, well as you can and do the same thing with this little part of the world over here. And if you do that, what you will find is that you have a lot more evidence to believe that this object is right here because so much of the world over here is overlapping really well with the shape of your object. And again, the first step of that was to use feature vectors to identify plumbing part-like points in the world or tank-like points in our terrain. And the second part was to do alignment to basically verify that I have found a good match. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, yeah? Is there some analog for the Harris corner detector thing to find interesting starting points? There is. And in fact, um, the, I, I tried to give you a sense in the very first lecture that in some fundamental way, the 3D surface problem is fundamentally easier than the 2D photograph problem because there's no projection. So what people have done with 3D surface data is simply say um, planar parts of the world are not that interesting. Or parts of the world that vary, very, that vary, V-A-R-R-Y, vary, V-E-R-Y, slowly with space 
are, in some sense, not interesting. It's not where the action is. So it's, it's, it becomes a little bit easier to identify interesting regions of uh, 3D surface data because it's where there's a lot of um, interesting shape going on. Any other questions? So um, thus far, I have talked about kind of problems in which you might have a 3D scan of one object <coughs> that you are trying to place in a 3D scan of the world. Well, imagine instead that you have two 3D scans of the world. One comes from Landsat or some other satellite technology. And the other one comes from the car that you are sitting in. So from Landsat, we have a very large scale map covering the entire world, basically. And that's shown in green. And meanwhile, I am in a car right here, or a Humvee or something. And it is taking a 3D scan of the world, kind of looking out from this direction, using something like time of flight laser radar. Now, if I can do a good job of finding a match between the red 3D scan and the green 3D scan, then I can basically use this as something like a poor man's GPS, as a way of figuring out where the heck I am in this large, extended 3D model called the entire world. So if you're wondering, why don't you just use GPS? Imagine that instead of being a car out in the desert, you're on the Mars Pathfinder on Mars, where there's no GPS. Or if you're on the moon, say. So you can use this <coughs> to basically do what's called ego location, which is to say, answer the question of where you are in a large map. So these are all the interesting and very useful things that you can do if you can align 3D data sets together. However, like any other kind of sensing technology, 3D sensors are not perfect. They are not able to tell you the positions of objects and points in the real world to a perfect degree of certainty. Every data set you get will have some amount of noise in it. And so, for example, if you, uh, hmm, that didn't print very well, but if you have a part of the world that, uh, what's a good example? That's like a step between this surface and the surface of the chalkboard. Ideally, and you are sensing it from this direction, from where you're sitting, ideally what you would want to get out of your, your device is a set of points that cover the uh, screen and then a stiff drop off and then a perfect set of points that flatly covers the chalkboard. In fact, the thing that you will actually observe coming out of your 3D sensor is something that looks like that, where it's basically the original signal that you that is real, that covers the actual thing in the real world, plus some amount of noise. And we consider that we think of this as being additive noise. So there's sort of an underlying signal, and then there's a bunch of junk that your sensor adds to it. And when you add those two together, you get the thing that you actually observe coming out of your, of your sensor. So um, basically, noise causes your feature values for your feature vector to be less consistent from data set to data set. In other words, less precise. And it also makes alignments more difficult to compute because it's less certain. If you go back to my example of verifying that the tank is where you think the tank is supposed to be in the scene, basically, uh, you have less of a clear sense of whether the shapes align well with each other, that the two meshes align well with each other, if there's noise. So it's a very general problem in 3D surfaces to try to remove noise from scans. Mesh smoothing is a very practical problem for people who are interested in computer graphics. If you, get a, if you get a 3D scan of your bunny and you want to put it in a movie, you don't want to have a pockmarked bunny that looks uh, kind of has this kind of artifact on it. And if you zoom in close to, uh, into a 3D scan of a figurine like this, you can see all these little bumps and bruises. It's just not very attractive. It's also, um, it, it, and it's, it's very practical in other situations too. So recall that I very briefly mentioned that one of the projects I was involved with as a grad student was to make a 3D model of the interior of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor site to basically be able to tell whether the walls were caving in or not. 
So in order to measure whether the walls were caving in or not, you can imagine doing a scientific simulation where you actually simulate the forces of gravity acting on each one of the points of the wall. Well, if the walls are noisy, so that you don't have a very precise sense of where those points are, then that can mess up your scientific simulation, which messes up your sense of whether the walls are going to collapse or not. So noise causes problems for scientific simulations as well. OK. Now, well, let's talk about some solutions to this mesh smoothing problem. It's common to think of uh, smoothing a 3D data set as an iterative evolution over time. So we have an initial surface that looks like this, and we are iteratively going to try to take the bumps and bruises out of it. So the first time we do it, we end up with this one, which looks a little bit smoother. There's not this hard edge here. And if we do it again, it gets even more smoother. And eventually, it becomes the smoothest thing you can possibly get, which is a sphere. And mathematically, imagine that I take all of my points that cover my 3D surface of interest, and I take all the 3D coordinates, x, y, z, and I arrange those into a very long vector, almost like one of my image patch intensity vectors that we talked about earlier. So I have this very long vector p, and it's got x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z for every point on my surface. Now imagine that u is a function that basically gives you a direction in which to move all of your 3D coordinates. So u of p spits out a vector that is the same length as your coordinates that gives you sort of a points you in the direction to move in. So that if you have an original, so that if you have an original surface p called p old before you have modified it, you can then modify it by adding this vector field to it. And then this, uh, basically this lambda is a coefficient that, that kind of makes you ease up and go slowly so that you don't overshoot and, and modify the positions of the points too far in one direction or another. <clears throat> and I guess if you wanted to think about it in um, calculus sort of terms, you can think of the entries of UP as being delta x1, delta, X1, uh, delta y1, delta z1, and so on. <laughs> So it's kind of the differential change in those x, y, z coordinate positions. So now um, the question then is, how do I formulate this function u of p? And let's think about uh, one very uh, restricted case of that, where uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to change the coordinates of one of my points in p. And sorry for the abuse of notation, but now imagine that p is just one point x, y, z. And you can see, and actually that should be a lowercase p, in fact. You can see the setup up there where I have a point p, and it's surrounded by neighbors, q1, q2, q3, and so on. And um, what I want to do is figure out in what direction should I move that point. Well, uh, there is a kind of an intuitive thing, which is to say, basically, if all the points around you are more or less on a plane, and p is sort of poking out above that, in order to smooth the surface, why don't we move P so that it's more close to being in the plane? So if P is sort of pokey, if it's sticking out, then that gives you a sense that it might be noise. It has that feeling of being away from the shape of the rest of the surface. So then how can you do that? Well, you can um, basically find a, an average of the, the positions of your neighbors, Q of I, and find an average position, call that P nu, and move p in that direction. So that's what this is doing. It takes a weighted combination of all the neighbors qi. So that's what this is doing here, taking a weight and then dividing by the sum of weights. That's, what, that's a weighted average of the positions of qi. And moving p in that direction. So it basically tries to, that's why you're subtracting p from it, is to move it in that direction. So now the question is, what should these weights be? Well, in the simplest case, you really actually do want to move um, P to the e exact central position in between all of the other Qs. And for that, all you would do is simply just take a not weighted combination, just a straight average of the positions of Q. But now, imagine that instead of this ideal case where all of the 
other points Q are kind of equally distant away from P. Imagine that there's some variability, so that some of the neighbors Q are very close and some of them are very far away. Then what you might want to do is actually downweight the contributions of where P should go depending on how far away its neighbors are. So in other words, the neighbors of P that are close to it have a big vote in saying where P should go. And the neighbors Q that are far away have less of a vote. So you can accomplish this by making the weighting inversely proportional to how far away Q is from P. <coughs> and simply put, if Q of I is further away from P of I, it's further away. And so its weighting goes down because you're taking the inverse of it. A similar thing can be achieved by making the weighting uh, Gaussian. So basically, this is going to have a uh, standard deviation, sigma. It's probably going to have a mean that is 0. And if the distance between P and Q is very large, then the weighting for that point Q is going to be relatively low. How low is going to be determined by the standard deviation of the Gaussian. And this is referred to as Gaussian smoothing, and it's very, very common. But the basic idea, or the intuition should be simple, which is that if a point is poking up out of the rest of the surface, you try to push it back down into the rest of the surface by finding a weighted combination of the positions of its neighbors around it. OK? And a simple variant of that is to, instead of taking the linear combination or a weighted combination of the surrounding point positions, you instead calculate the center of gravity of each one of the faces that the point P is connected to, and use those as the things that you take a weighted combination of to move towards. And for some reason, um, well, for one thing, if, if, the, um, if the resolution of the mesh is very variable, so that some of your neighbors are close and some of your neighbors are far away, Doing this, doing this uh, centroid or center of gravity thing actually makes, makes your smoothing more robust to these kinds of variability. And also, for some reason, it seems to just plain work better in practice, which is a little bit curious. Now, there is a bit of a problem, which is that if you, which is that I've told you that you do this smoothing iteratively. So you would start with your original surface. You would move the points P a little bit. Then you do it again. You move the points P a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. I didn't tell you when to stop. And in fact, in practice, what you have to do is basically try it. And try running it with 10 iterations. Try running it with 100 iterations. See what happens. What you will quickly find is that if you have a 3D surface like this, and you run it a small number of times, you basically remove uh, a lot of the noise from the surface. But if you keep on going, you remove the entire surface itself. And you end up with a solution like this, which technically, yes, has removed all the noise from your data set. But uh, really, it has removed everything from your data set. It's removed all the content, too, which is not what we want with smoothing. Imagine if you were doing photograph smoothing and you simply set all the pixels to zero. That would be the analog of, of this. So if you simply iterate too many times, you remove all of the interesting stuff and the noise. Furthermore, I mentioned this thing about overshooting, which is to say you have this uh, parameter lambda, which seems to come out of nowhere. But what it does is it eases you back. Even if you want to move a point to a particular location, it says, eh, only go half that far, only go a quarter that far. Just go a little bit of the way. And if you set this thing appropriately so that you only do go part of the way where you think you're supposed to go to get a smooth surface, then everything kind of works out. And if you don't and you overshoot, then you get a solution that looks like this, looks like nonsense. And what ends up happening is that if you don't constrain these point positions so that they go towards smooth and they go past smooth, then what ends up happening is you start out with a rough surface, and moving all the points gives you another rough surface. So then in the next iteration, it tries to undo that roughness and give you back to a smooth surface. It overshoots again. So you end up getting this kind of oscillating behavior in which none of the noise is actually removed at all. 
So lamb is often called a dampening constant for this reason. If, you're, if you visualize the points on your surface kind of moving up and down, what you don't want is for them to just move up and down with an arbitrary magnitude. You want them to kind of settle down to a solution. And setting the dampening constant to a, to a bad quantity uh, will not allow that to happen. Yeah? It should only happen when lambda is greater than one. Uh, it is not strictly it is not strictly guaranteed, but in all practical cases, if lambda is less than one, you should get uh, dampening behavior. Anybody else? Okay. Another interesting thing you will find is that not only will your uh, surface mesh of someone's face lose the nose and the mouth and the and the uh, eyes, but it will also shrink down into nothing. And so, if you look very carefully, this very rough surface of a skull, and you compare it to a Gaussian smooth one, the one on the right is actually smaller. It's hard to see, but it's, it's actually a little bit smaller. And here's a more obvious case where you have a big 3D surface of a person. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's more or less gone on a diet after Gaussian smoothing. The reason for this is highly, uh, is pretty interesting. It's a mathematical uh, thing that you can prove that basically uh, this multiple iterations of Gaussian smoothing is a zero pass filter. So, what does that mean? I'll show a little diagram on the next, um, on the next slide, but. When we talked about Gaussian smoothing and we talked about the frequency characteristics of it for photographs, I may have told you that it is what's called a low pass filter. Because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian, uh, basically what happens for the low frequency components, they are preserved and all the high frequency components are dampened out. Another way to phrase that is that if it's like a gate or a toll bridge, the low frequency components of the image are allowed to pass through. So the low frequencies pass through unharmed, and the high frequency ones are stopped at the gate. So that's why it's called a low pass filter, is because the low frequencies are allowed to pass through it. <coughs> well, what I'm telling you here is that if you do enough of these iterations of Gaussian smoothing, it goes from being a low pass filter to a no pass filter, which means that eventually you don't let anything through at all. Yeah. Oh, the sorry, the microphone. It, it, this this current process preserves the number of faces, doesn't add any. The number of what? Faces. Phases. Faces. F a c e s. Oh, f a c e s. Oh, uh, what do you mean exactly? Like it doesn't add new faces. Oh, that's right. Yes, it'll basically it, it moves your image from having the the intensities or positions it does to being completely flat. And the the mathematical term or the mathematical entity that you want to think about here is what's called the transfer function. It's basically the Fourier transform of the Gaussian operator as it's been applied over and over and over and over and over again. What you find, and this is, you can think of this as the Fourier transform, the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the uh, Gaussian filter, and it, it looks like a Gaussian because it is a Gaussian. So this is what I mean by low, low pass filter. The low frequencies are on this end of the diagram. And the Gaussian has high magnitude. So the low frequencies here are more or less allowed to just pass through. The high frequencies out here are stopped. So what you can show mathematically is that if you apply a Gaussian filter, and then you apply a Gaussian filter again, and then you apply a Gaussian filter again, and again, and again, and again, what happens is that you're basically multiplying these Gaussians together. And what you end up with is a, a Fourier transform of your overall operation that looks like this. And, it, and the, basically, what frequencies pass through gets more attenuated and more attenuated, more picky and more picky. And eventually, if you do this 100 times or many, many times, this thing looks like a delta function centered at 0. So that's just to say that your gate through which you allow low frequencies to pass and you stop high frequencies at get, gets more and more picky and more and more picky over time so that basically nothing can get through it. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another curious, interesting um, 
mathematical fact is that you can get low pass filter behavior by repeatedly doing two phases of this averaging operation or this Gaussian smoothing operation instead of one. <coughs> and in fact, the way it works is that the first phase does traditional vertex averaging the way we've been talking about. And the second phase partially undoes that averaging. So here, lambda is greater than 0 and less than 1, which is to say you move the pixel or you move the points in the direction of smoothness. Now, for the second phase, you take that, those same directions and you move them in the other direction. So here, mu is a constant that is less than 0. So here you're moving them towards the smooth direction, and here you're moving them away from the smooth direction. So it's kind of a curious thing, but you can actually prove that what this does, if you look at the transfer function of the resulting operation, it actually does preserve low frequency components. It actually does work as a low pass filter. But it's completely counterintuitive to me that you can actually get smoothing behavior by doing iterative steps of smoothing and then unsmoothing and then smoothing again and then unsmoothing again and then smoothing again. But it's true. Lots of things are counterintuitive but true. <clears throat> a related idea to this is to go beyond the idea of finding a new position for my point based on my immediate neighbors to go spatially further than that and try to find a new position for my point based on many, many points over an extended neighborhood. So here, shown in kind of orangey-brown, are my original uh, points. And what I would like to do is conceptualize a true or underlying surface that gave rise to them. So in one of the very first slides, I gave you the example of the 3D, the real underlying 3D surface of the screen and the real underlying 3D surface of the chalkboard. And then the thing that we actually get out of our sensor is that thing plus a bunch of junk, right? So that's what's happening here. There is a real underlying gray surface. And the thing that we observe are the uh, orangey-brown points. So now, uh, one thing that you can imagine doing to remove, or the way you can formulate the removal of noise is to remove the jitters that jitter you off of the real surface, or to remove these little translations that move you off of the true underlying surface. And so if we're successful at that, we, we can basically suck all the points back onto the real surface. So then, the question goes away from how should I move a point based on my immediate neighbors, but how should I estimate where the real true underlying surface is based on points that are in some extended neighborhood? One simple thing you can do is say, well, uh, the, the entire surface itself might have some complicated shape to it, but in a local neighborhood, if I just look at an immediate neighborhood around myself, probably a locally planar approximation is going to do a fair job of estimating the shape of the surface. So if I'm at that blue point, the thing I can do is assume that the, that the surface is locally planar, estimate where that plane is, what its position and orientation is, and then move the blue point onto the plane. So then the key question becomes, how do you estimate what that plane should be? And in this bilateral filtering approach, basically, all of the points that are in the neighborhood of this blue one sort of vote, or they give their, they give their opinion as to what the best locally planar approximation to the surface should be. So, uh, and there's two components to that. Basically, uh, points that are far away from the blue point shouldn't have much of a vote. And furthermore, uh, points that seem to be outliers, in other words, points that are far away from a consensus tangent plane, shouldn't have much of a vote either. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you can do is basically get estimates for what this plane should be from some of the points and then determine how well the rest of the other ones fit it. And it turns out the ones that are very far away from it don't fit very well, so you downweight, downweight their contributions. And the good thing about this 
is that when you get to a kind of a corner on your surface, like right here, or you know, right here, these points over here, since they've been down weighted, they can't pull the tangent plane towards this direction, or the locally planar approximation. So it's called bilateral filtering because you're doing these two things to downweight the contributions of other points. The similarity here and closeness. So again, the, simple, the basic uh, idea here is that you're trying to move from having your immediate neighbors tell you where the point position to go to having more of an extended sense of where the surface is. Any questions about this? Okay, uh, announcements. So uh, homework one, as you all know, is due. And homework two will be posted to SmartSite today uh, or tonight, right? Uh, in fact, it may, have, it may already be there. Or maybe not. Anyway, the poem or two we posted tonight, and um, I don't think I have actually, it's been on the calendar since the very beginning, but the midterm is on November 1st. So uh, now you know. And I'll probably post an announcement to SmartSite saying exactly that so that everybody knows. Um, the format for the midterm, I think I have described already, but it's basically, it'll test your understanding of the lecture slides and kind of hopefully the big ideas to the degree that you can test those in, a, in an exam. And you'll be given things like a, an example problem to solve and say, how, do you, how would you solve it? That kind of thing. Any questions about administrative stuff? All right. OK, so now um, we have talked about smoothing in terms of adjusting the positions of points in the surface. Another way to think about it is that you might want to formulate the problem in terms of adjusting the curvature of the mesh, where the curvature is a local measure of the shape of the surface, which we will make mathematically concrete in a minute. So um, high curvature regions are where the surface normal, everyone knows what the surface normal is? It's basically if you have a surface, the tangent plane is the tangent to it, you should know what that is, and the surface normal is perpendicular to that tangent. Um, now, high curvature regions are where that surface normal orientation changes very, very rapidly, and that should be intuitive. If the surface is undulating a lot, then as you move from point to point, the surface normal is basically changing from one direction to another to another very, very quickly. So then, um, you can imagine, instead of formulating the process of smoothing in terms of iteratively moving, changing the point positions, you can change that to talk about iteratively changing the orientations of normals on the surface. So, right. Um, and in particular, what we're going to want to do is move a point a lot if its curvature is high. So, uh, let's see. H is now going to be a function that, that evaluates the curvature of the surface at a particular location. And the normal to the surface is going to be n. So this will give us a vector, and this will give us a number. So what we want to do is if the curvature is high, we want to smooth a lot. Because basically that's telling us that this point is poking up out of the surface a lot. And we want to move it back in in the direction of the surface normal. So now, the, and, oh, and also we still have a dampening constant for the same reason we had before, that we can overshoot the smooth surface and go right back to a completely different but uh, other um, rough surface. So now we have to compute curvatures. And this just gives you a very simple diagram of sort of the, dis, the difference between what you would get in vertex-based smoothing, which is what we used to, what we start out with, and curvature-based smoothing, which is what we're going to talk about now. <coughs> and again, here H is the local curvature of the surface, N is the surface normal, and you try to move the point in that direction by some amount. So here's the definition of curvature for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, let's say that we start with a point in 2D. So the curvature of a curve in 1D is defined mathematically as the instantaneous rate of change in the slope as a function of arc length. 
So for every point on the surface, you can calculate the tangent line for it, and that's unique and well-defined. And what you can do is travel along this curve and calculate the slope at each point in it. And in fact, you can chart what the slope is for every position on this curve. Uh, and then take the derivative of that. So that'll tell you the rate of change of slope. That's what curvature is. If the curvature is very high, the slope is changing very, very quickly. If the curvature is low, it's not changing very fast. And if the curvature is zero, it's not changing at all. OK? So now, for a surface, we don't have one unique tangent line. So if we're in a 3D world, uh, we can define a contour that goes in any possible direction through this point P. So how do we calculate the curvature? Well, here's how we do it. We basically, for every point on the surface, we can intersect it with a plane that goes through the surface normal, which is this direction, and intersect the surface. And if we get the intersection of that plane and the surface, we'll get some contour that looks like this, and we can calculate the curvature of this thing using this formula. And then what we can do is basically this plane is arbitrary. You can spin it around so that it is always going through the surface normal and always intersecting with the surface. And for each one of those positions or for each one of those orientations, you will get a different one of these curves and therefore a different curvature. So I haven't answered your question of how you actually calculate curvature for a 3D surface. Well, the, um, for any one of those planes that intersects the surface, the curvature of that curve is called the normal curvature. And the principal curvatures are the maximum and minimum, maxima and minima of the normal curvatures. And the mean curvature is the average of those principal curvatures. So almost all the time when someone talks about the curvature of a surface evaluated at a particular point, they're talking about the mean curvature. But uh, that's kind of a little bit arbitrary in that you have some distribution of these normal curvatures as you spin that intersecting plane around, and they have take all sorts of values that are between k max and k min. But, but just for practical purposes, when someone tells you about the curvature, they're usually talking about the mean curvature. So the mean curvature um, can be computed by integrating the normal curvature over all the intersecting planes. But um, if you have a discrete surface, then you can basically approximate this by draw, only drawing those intersecting planes along the edges of your mesh. So if this is my point on my surface, and these are all of the surrounding points to it, then basically what I can do is contemplate the possibility of, spin, of having a plane that goes through the surface normal and intersecting it with the, plane, with the surface in all possible orientations. Or, as an approximation, I can just have a plane that goes through the surface normal at the point and through each one of these mesh edges. Boom, boom. And I can approximate the, um, the normal curvatures that way. Basically take the maximum and minimum of that as the principal curvatures. And you can also basically uh, formulate the, um, the 3D function of what the surface is in terms of its Taylor expansion. And I won't really go through this in too much detail, but you can use that to estimate the curvatures by uh, truncating the Taylor expansion of the surface. <coughs> and it turns out that there's a, there's a recent tool that has come out of the computer graphics world called discrete exterior calculus that instead of formulating the uh, estimation of curvature in terms of these intersecting planes, and instead of formulating it in terms of the continuous Taylor expansion of the entire surface, they could take an entirely different approach, which I won't go through, but basically relies on calculating the angles between your point of interest and the, um, and the faces that it makes with each one of its neighbors, Q1, Q2, and so on. And it turns out that if you simply take some trigonometric functions of these angles of the, of the faces that the point makes with its neighbors, you get a fair approximation to the mean curvature. And more importantly, in practice, when you apply all of these different algor algorithms to your 
real meshes that really come off of scanners, this discrete exterior calculus approximation gives you the best, most robust approximation to what the mean curvature is. So, um, if you recall, in the early part of the course, we talked about isotropic and anisotropic smoothing. And uh, the idea was that isotropic smoothing is the same everywhere. That's what the Latin means. And anisotropic is not the same everywhere. So you do a different amount of smoothing depending on uh, various characteristics of the image. The same is true here. Bilateral filtering is anisotropic. You don't simply perform the same averaging operation at every location. How much you average with your neighbors depends on where your neighbors are with respect to you. And curvature-based smoothing that uh, moves points dependent on how much curvature there is can be made anisotropic using the same principle. It, which is to say, you know, if you want to preserve curvature in some sense, you can make the amount that you smooth dependent in a nonlinear way based on the curvature. So if you want to preserve corners where the curvature is very, very high, you can say actually don't smooth there, don't move vertices that where the curvature is extremely high. And it's a lot like anisotropic image smoothing where we say, okay, if the difference in an image intensity between two adjacent pixels is very, very high, actually don't smooth there at all. So it's the same idea but applied to curvatures. But again, you have the same gotchas. You have to basically define ahead of time how much difference in, how much curvature is okay and give the connotation of a corner as opposed to noise that you want to remove. Here are some uh, results using curvature-based smoothing. Uh, I'm going to turn the light off for this. The thing on the left is the input scan. As you can see, very, very noisy. Um, and this just gives two different approaches to doing anisotropic uh, filtering. This one is an iterative approach that basically uses the uh, anisotropic changes in curvature, like I just described. And this uses that bilateral filtering. So this is basically a curvature-based approach, and this is a vertex-based approach. But they're both anisotropic. Hopefully you can see that both of them preserve the curvature of the lips, some of the features of the nose and the eye sockets pretty well. And um, I don't know, you might notice that some of the part of the cheek of the one in the middle is a little bit more pocked, but I think the difference between the one in the middle and the one on the right is relatively, relatively small. Here's another result. Uh, with a similar punchline that basically anisotropic smoothing can do a pretty good job of removing noise. <coughs> Excuse me, whether you use vertex-based or curvature-based approaches. You can study these quite a bit, actually, and find features, or when I say features, I mean kind of visual features, not feature vectors, of course, that are preserved in one or the other, or both. And kind of compare the two that way. So curvature-based methods are kind of in vogue these days because it has this property that, it, that you can robustly and accurately uh, estimate curvature across a wide range of noise levels and, image, and scan resolution. Um, and in, it kind of sidesteps this message, this problem that um, how much to move a point with vertex-based methods depends on the size of the neighborhood and the, um, the mesh resolution. And this is just one more example that, uh, of Gaussian smoothing and curvature-based smoothing. What you should see is that even if you do a lot of curvature-based smoothing, too much so that it removes everything out of the image, you still end up with some identifying features. And if you keep doing Gaussian smoothing, you really, honest to goodness, end up with nothing. Any last minute questions? Yeah. Um, the two page handout is on SmartSite? For? You said recommended reading. Yes, it should be. Okay. Uh, it should be there from last time. It's not, not modified from the last time I gave the course, so. All right, thank you.